Why, hello there. It's me, Jeremy, your favorite bald dude telling you about Standard and Strange, a store and a brand with simple rules. Sell clothes they themselves would wear, manufacture it ethically, and build it to last. From boots made in Oregon to loop wheel garments made in Japan, find all the best clothes for your wardrobe at Standard and Strange. Standardandstrange.com. Hello! Okay, okay, look, we're back. We're back with a new season of Blamo. Isn't that great? Isn't life great? I know how you feel if it's not. <laughs> Things are, uh, they're just, well, they're challenging these days, to say the absolute least. Uh, well, look, when it feels like there's no relief anywhere, when hope is lost, when life just sucks, um, call somebody. It might get worse before it gets better. But the sun will rise again. I know that sounds stupid. I'm being a bit vague on purpose, but I'm stressing the importance of leaning into the future. You'll get there. And I'm so, so glad you're here and you've chosen to listen to this pod. I'm your host, Jeremy Kirkland. Hell of an intro, right? (laughs) Well, we got this. So our guest this week, season premiere, is Matt Lambert. And oh man, this was a fun pod. I want to give some context here on who he is, because as you'll hear, he was an early, early dude working at Sid Mashburn. We're talking early, folks. I think he was employee number five. Uh Uh-oh. Hopefully, fact check me. Uh, You know, do you remember the original three from that GQ spread in 2010? You may be like, dude, I I don't know what you're talking about. Well, here you go. Let me educate you. You had Pete Samuelson, Justin Doss, who then went on to work at GQ, by the way, and and then probably the longest tenured employee at Sid, other than Sid, Mr. Matt Lambert. He did so much there, always adding his little twist on things, doing the whole sloppy tailoring thing. Do you know what I mean? It's It was just like this kind of American sprezzatura, the, the purposeful dishevelment. It's difficult to explain, but when you see him, you, you know exactly what I mean. He was there until recently when he left to embrace his tailoring evolution with the brand Factors. Uh, It's a brand that he created, and he resurrected this new form of tailoring that, to me, feels like the perfect example of what a dude who was in a rock band does when he makes clothes. (laughs) I'm serious. It's beautiful. It's elegant. It's it's got this, uh, this incredible 1970s vibe that is also very, well, now. (laughs) <laughs> we talk about everything from his music career to his time at Sid to what's happening at Factors. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. I'm so glad you're here. Let's go. Well, you even got, what, are those Grado headphones? Is everything that you have like dope? I try. <laughs> I try to buy stuff that lasts a long time and it makes me feel good, you know? No, hey, I appreciate <laughs> it. I'm glad. Well, well thanks, thanks for chatting. I'm glad. I, I know the original plan was to try to do this in in person yeah you know sadly we're we're remote not not even COVID related just travel but i don't know say la vie how are things very good man really good it's been busy lately um it's been exciting yeah so you're you're in you're in your studio slash atelier slash store yeah it's uh i've got like this 450 square foot space and little five points and uh, I do everything out of here. So I host appointments here. We do all of our planning here. I have band practice here. We do all of our fittings here um, for the appointments, whether it be outside alterations for friends and whatnot or custom suiting appointments. And then as of recently, we started carrying a little stock. Finally, we put ourselves in a situation. Yeah. Yeah. You're doing some ready to wear stuff now, right? Yeah. Yeah. We started doing ready to wear. We launched it um, really with Essence back in November. Right. And then we were able to start carrying a set of um, trousers and shirting and a, some blissons here in the office as a small stock run which we'll try to ramp our way up into hanging suits and leather too. But um, right now we started with just the, just some essentials and like seasonal pieces that we had for the current collection, Jeez. which has been good. It's great. We don't have a lot of space to work with. Mm-hmm. Like again, it's like a 450 square foot space. You have to be really strategic about what you can actually carry 
but what also gives the space enough oomph because right. it is small, but we try to make it seem and play bigger, you know, than <laughs> it is. But I, I love it. I think it's as contemporary of a model as you can get now. It works perfectly with my lifestyle. And hopefully so far, I feel like customers have been very receptive to it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I definitely want to, want to chat about factors and, and how that stuff's going on, because I think as an aside, it is the, it, it is, it is kind of like the new standard of how a brand and like a fashion house can operate in the sense that it's really you. I mean, you and your son, but it's you. And, you know, so the fact that you're into music and you're playing music and, you know, it, it, that I feel like in the past that used to be somewhat siloed, right. From every designer. And now because you are the designer, you are really the product. People want to associate everything that you like, you know, whether it's, you know, and some of this stuff, and we'll talk about Sid too. I feel like Sid was a guy who who did a good job of being like, yeah, but these tacos are just as important to this store. <laughs> right. It's the true, uh, true condition of lifestyling, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, but let's jump back because, you know, I met you, you were at Sid, but you had a whole other life and career before this that I, I think deserves, uh, you know, a ton of attention because your music career is I mean, the music you made still is is incredible. And I think so at the time I was working at the Beggars Group and you were, were you on Touch and Go? I was, yeah. I okay. Was, uh, we, that was, we signed to Touch and Go, funny enough, the same year that I started for Sid. And I always joke around and say we were the last band signed to Touch. We put them out of business. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, we were the, we, we were signed to Touch and Go in 2008, the same year that I started with Sid. So I had both of these kind of dream opportunities parallel with each other, but they also kind of tour each other in different directions. You know, they didn't flow very well naturally because um, there weren't many people on our team at Sid and we were like this quickly growing business that all hands on deck. And then at the same time, I'm with this band that is making their second record finally has this record deal that we can get some steam behind us. And uh, they, but Sometimes that doesn't go, <laughs> you got to get out there and you got to tour, you know, and that's very difficult to do when you're expect your expectations at the store level were so high too. Cause also I was working alongside my best friend. So I felt like I, if I were out, I was putting them in a bad position too. So it was, a, it, I mean, it was a pretty difficult time to, you know, navigate, but yeah, I was, we, I had a great, um, a great little deal. What was your band called? All the saints was the name of that band. Yeah. And I, we still play. I can, you know, we play like once a year or something. We'll pull it out and get loud. Um, we, we after the Touch and Go record, we found another label, um, City Swing slash Suterain in Europe, and did another record with them there. And that was, I think, that was the final one for like seven or eight years until we put one out three years ago on our own. But are with our friend Chunklet here in Atlanta. But yeah, we still make music, um, just not as much since the pandemic, of course. But yeah, that was a. Uh, Definitely a moment in time. <laughs> well, pre-08, I mean, how did you get into music? Did you did you grow up around the Georgia area? I grew up in Alabama. And I mean, honestly, the only real interest I've had since I was a kid was music and clothes. You know, I did the sports thing for a little bit until essentially like late middle school. And then I got into playing guitar. Well, I guess ninth, 10th grade, I got into playing guitar and immediately like wanted to start a band in high school. I did, did so and kind of always kept a project going. And so I moved to Atlanta after college okay. um, in 04, and that's when we started All the Saints. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, something I definitely want to kind of like state for the record is, you know, so many people, especially at the time you guys were doing music in All the Saints, you know, I was at Beggars. I was also in a band trying to do it. And it's really tough when you you see on one hand the stability of a different type of career, right? In your case, Sid. and you know, in my case at beggars, but the, the allure of life on the road and gigging and playing shows is amazing. And I remember the thing that threw me off the most is a friend that was in a band that was very successful at the time was telling me like, he wasn't so sure how much money they were going to make this year and how he was going to be able to do this and this. And at the time I had met the love of my life, now my wife. And I was like, oh shit. I, and I, I pulled the ripcord, like I bailed. I mean, I still love music and it's still a part of me. I mean, there's literally guitars, right? <laughs> you know, back here. You're right. But like my love of, of yeah, music totally like overtook my love of playing. And I'm just kind of curious, like how you balance that, because obviously 
you know, Sid at the time was like a rocket ship and you were on the ground floor. Right. Um, I tried to find ways in every, and I was also already a, a dad at that point too. So you, you take that, that's another reason that made touring very difficult and yeah. also had to keep us like a steady level of income. I'm not, we weren't like, you know, 21 all free and single and hitting the road 360 <laughs> days a year. Yeah. I never had that opportunity with, with all the saints. And so we had to be again, very strategic about how we went about it. But, you know, we would, we're practicing two or three nights a week after work and we're fitting in little small, short run tours where we can hopefully doing like one or two weeks at a time, once or twice a year. But um, while we're doing that, I'm already at this position of Sid where he, he kind of has me and my buddy Pete and he splits the entire store between the two of us as far as vendors are concerned. So you can imagine at that time, there's a lot of, a lot of design and buying and merchandising as well as like selling and cleaning and <laughs> just the everyday ops of what went on in that store at the same time as trying to, you know, write songs, write lyrics, record, figure out what we're going to play, figure out who we're going to play with and, you know all that comes along with trying to be in a band at the same time. But yeah, I had this, I had this like moment on that, like this kind of watershed moment with Sid and touch and go. That's that early on that kind of like gave me the trajectory of where I am now. And it was this moment where we had left on this tour and we do a month in the States. We go to South by Southwest and then we do a month in Europe. And that was the moment Holy. where I'm like, okay, I will know by the middle or end or whatever of this tour, whether or not I'm going to be able to play music for my career or if I'm going to be in the clothing business, you know? Um, and Sid gave me his graces to do so, like to go on this tour. So we head off and I, I kid you not, it was like a week that touch and go called. And it's like, we're shutting it down. Well, that was also <laughs> so, the, the financial so I'm like, crisis Sid, I'm too. Coming. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. so we're, which, a which lot of labels Sid, were going out. Yeah, totally. And, and I think Corey had just done all this amazing stuff and he had, he had just kind of done what he had set out to do in a way. So Corey mm -hmm. would touch and go. So it wasn't, it was just one of those moments where, okay, Sid, I'm coming back. I'll be back in two <laughs> weeks. <laughs> I'll be digging in in two weeks. Save me a spot. Um, but yeah, the, where, where the financial crisis, the crisis, like it, it just kind of tore the music industry apart a little bit. It helped Sid. It completely helped our business here really? in Atlanta. Oh, one no, no doubt. Because what I was able to see firsthand is Neiman Marcus was at one price point and doing very well, you know. Mm -hmm. And then 2008 hits, market dives. Sid is now opening up. We're getting some steam. We have suits that are hanging at fifteen hundred to three thousand dollars, coming from a customer who's been paying five thousand to eight thousand dollars for Brioni and Keton, and then down to like Isaiah in the early days of three or four. You know, yeah. So it made what it put so much value behind what we were doing in that store at Sid's to where we weren't even we were regular price, but we seemed like such a deal. And the service, of course, it was just an environment that just worked perfectly. Where I think we got those converts from people who were paying higher price points in a designer world, you know, as Saks and Neiman. So it, 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 to me, it just completely worked in our favor. I mean, I think that, and then there was also like the infamous spread, right? Like you, the infamous photo spread of you, Justin Doss and Pete on one side and GQ and then Sid on the other two page spread. Yeah. And it was all about, um, I mean, at the time GQ was writing about like highlighting um, basically like new haberdasheries, right. For lack of a better term, like these are all like the best places you need to go. This is why you should be there. And then, you know, this was kind of like the perfect, perfect time. It was when Rappaport was on before he went nuts. Um, it was, you know, a bunch of other folks that were, uh, like Will Welch and all these people come down, Corey Wilson, all the, the GQ crew comes down. You guys have this party at your store. Yeah. And then Sid is on video. And this was the crazy thing because I remember I was so confused at first because Sid Mashburn, I'm like, this is like the coolest dude ever. Everything he talks about is a story that ties into other, some other entry point of menswear. He's talking to me about a football game. He's talking to me about food. He's talking to me about music, not clothes first. 
It was always right. a different entry point and then the close. But the craziest thing is I remember you guys might have sold more APC jeans than APC was because every you guys pushed this look. And, and, and yeah. very much it was all of your guys' personal style too. I mean, you, Pete, Justin, I mean, all, all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, a lot of friends that I still hang with now um, came to SIDS and some of which work for SID now because we were on that APC vendor list. We were a yeah. stockist for that for APC and um, not many people in the Southeast had it. It was right on the front end of the whole raw denim, salvage denim thing. Mm-hmm. Um, Sid was brilliant to put that alongside Levi's shrink to fits, you know? And I remember for the, for the first year, we didn't even charge to tailor shrink to fits for customers. It was like on the house until our <laughs> tailor said, you we're going to go out of business if you don't charge to taper these $45 blue jeans. But yeah. I had every friend in East Atlanta <laughs> in 501 shrink to fits. I mean, our pants were like halfway up our calves, you know, because right. we were just, we were tailoring them all and making them look like we want and treating them like we want. And it was the gateway drug that is still a brilliant way to do a retail shop now, you know? Well, because, yeah, I think like the best thing, and I mean, I remember going there on, on Howl Mill and because, at, you know, the Sid Mashburn store was not where, say, um, the Sid Mashburn LA store is now, right? In terms of like no. Redwood Country Mart, which is like, this is where you want to be. Like, what was it? 801 Howl Mill. I mean, that was, there was nothing there. It, it he was the on beginning. the front. He was like in the, in the group of like pioneers to that area, but, what he did that was very smart is he followed food. He yeah. put himself around three strategic price points of food, you know, which creates lunch tra- traffic and it creates nighttime traffic and people can window shop when they're drinking next door after hours and come back the next day for our next time they go to lunch. Mm-hmm. It also brought in a big, uh, like a lot of women shoppers, which is very, very important um, be- because they would come in during their lunch breaks or during their you know, lunches or whatever, and they would come by the shop and then see stuff for their husbands mm-hmm. and buy it. And that would get them coming in for their alterations and everything. So it was a good, very good synergy with that center. But yes, he was on the front end of, it's nothing like it is now. You know, it's completely built up now. Yeah. And I think something that was really cool that, you know, it, whether it was you guys or Sid or you as a collective, all of you were wearing the same clothes differently. I mean, your yeah. style, I think, is is kind of... Uh, you know, somewhat disheveled, kind of like relaxed, like really chill. Um, say like, you know, Justin's at the time was almost, you know, purposely loud or some sort of weird quirk to it. But all of you were wearing the same stuff. And previously, I mean, because I worked in tons of different levels of retail over the years, your uniform was a uniform. Like your tie had to be exactly this way. Your jacket had to be exactly this way, you know, your pants, but all of you guys looked very different. And so I think it was really interesting because there was different entry points for different types of people all within the same brand. Yeah. And part of that becomes or comes from the fact that we all four of us loved clothes, you know, and it wasn't something we had just recently gotten into. I think all four of us were born to be in this industry. Yeah. And be a part of and like be of the cloth, you know. So when you put that into a young store like that, it was a dream. It was a dream store to me. I remember I was at Neiman's and I had a friend there who was my mentor, so to say, that got me into um this is a very long winded story, but it'll make no, everything fine. make sense. Like I grew up in a men's store in high school in Jasper, Alabama, that's been there since the mid fifties. And it was the type of place where you get the glass Coke or you have the coffee pot on and you talk about life first and then we shop. And it, like he, my, my boss, Rusty, who owned that store, like was the mayor of that city, you know? Mm-hmm. So that's how I was raised in this business where it's hospitality based. We do, you know, I'm out in the car every day after school, driving around alterations and gifts, wrapped gifts to people's houses and things like that. So I had the menswear background and I knew that that was where, by the time I got to college, I knew that that's where I was going was like menswear, you know, um, went to Alabama with a marketing major, focus on fashion retail, graduate, take a job with Neiman's. Neiman's puts me around fashion. And a higher price point, handmade. What do you mean clothing. by fashion? Like, I'm um, like Dolce and Gabbana, Gucci, oh. Prada, like f- real fashion. You know, in Jasper, okay. I wasn't around that. I mean, 
I knew those things from magazines and such and loving clothes, but I never owned any or would never like hung out with people that had acquired any, like it wasn't anything that came to Jasper, Alabama really. And this was pre sax in Birmingham too. You you were going to Macy's and Parisian at the would be the highest of right. the the best of the best besides like a couple of specialty shops in Birmingham. But so when I came over to Neiman's, I took this whole other background and, and like learned all I was still in I was the youngest guy in the department probably by 20 years in clothing you know and ties and furnishings but I latched on to this one one friend there who was very into Brioni and Keaton and he he kind of showed me that world and like got me very knowledgeable about it you know so um he was recruited by Sid early on when Sid decided that Atlanta was his market and so I'm in the back of Neiman's in the fitting room one day and Keith, my friend that was over Brioni and Keaton there was like, there's this guy coming to the West side. He's got this concept and he pulls out this vendor list to show me of what he's going to carry. And the first three things on that vendor list are Levi's, Clark's Desert Boots and Keaton. The fir- the top three. And I, at the, this was 2007, you know, and I was like, shit, he needs to be talking to me, not you. You know, like, this is my... <laughs> <laughs> this is my joint, right? This is where I need, this is my life. This is where I need to be, you know? Yeah. So um, when he opened up, he had Quaddy. He had Quaddy Moccasin and Pete and I were already like big into that, you oh, know? Yeah. This is 2007 and he's carrying this moccasin brand that probably nobody in our city knows what it is, you know? So I, we go over there and uh, I take my then three-year-old son to the store with Pete. I, I scoop. Pete up. This is like a two week period to where I'm in between playing music and not working anywhere. So we're in my, you know, the all the Saints van riding around Atlanta. I go to <laughs> Lennox Mall and pick up Pete and I've got my three year old in the back. <laughs> and we just go into Sid Mashburn and, and you know, like we just strike it up. And um, I wanted to work there so badly, but I didn't want to, t- I didn't want to offer myself, I, I didn't want to present myself as a half time, part time worker. You know, I wanted to be yeah. like, I didn't want to go say, and I'm going to be on tour every other month. Cause at that time I was like, that's, that was what I wanted to do. So Pete, however, was ready to go. So we kind of just stayed close. And then the, the guy that came down with Sid to open that shop ended up taking his job, his corporate job back. And he moved back to the Midwest and then which opened up a position for Sid to hire Pete. Well, I remember Pete, I was outside Drunken Unicorn MJQ in Atlanta. We were doing like a sound check and Pete calls me and is like, I got the job. I'm like, fuck. (laughs) (laughs) I love you, but fuck, you got the job. So I was like, man, now I got to go, you know? So um, he hired, he he hired Pete. And then within like two weeks, I was over there working as well. Essentially, Pete and I just made him hire us. Yeah. You know, because it was too perfect not for, for us not to be working there. And that's what. We wanted to be there so badly, which then created this, you know, we're not, we're not working a job. We're like hanging out, selling people stuff that we think's the best and very cool, you know? So it felt that you could feel that as a customer, I would imagine. It's that time again, the time for the old Jer Bears picks from Standard and Strange. You know what I'm talking about. They're one of my favorite clothing stores on earth with locations in Oakland, Santa Fe and New York City. They have everything from incredible leather jackets and boots to the highest quality Japanese denim. Look, it's getting a little warm, and I'm loving their new gear from Orslo. But by the way, before I start going crazy, here's a little tip, folks. If you don't have a pair of fatigue pants in your wardrobe, you're just missing out. And pair it with the Western shirt from Standard & Strange, and you're going to unite the world. Okay? This is, I mean, I'm serious. They're great. And look, if you're still thinking, just head over to standardandstrange.com and see why they're one of my favorite shops. I mean, what other retail store donates 2% of their revenue, not profits, to giving back? I love these folks, and so should you. So visit standardandstrange.com to learn more. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for their mailing list so you never miss the latest dope gear they have at standardandstrange.com. That's standardandstrange.com. Every day I get up and look in the mirror, and I say, face it, Kirkland, you're a watch dude. Admit it to yourself. You know me, I've always loved watches for ages, but buying them is not always easy. The best thing I've learned is to buy the dealer, not the watch, because you want to work with someone you trust and who will help you on your journey. Because, geez, you think you're only going to buy one? Ha! That's why I work with Topper Jewelers. Located in the heart of Silicon Valley, 
Topper Fine Jewelers has remained a proudly family-owned retail store in Burlingham, California for over three generations. Not three years, three generations. They are an authorized dealer for Omega, Breitling, Hamilton, Seiko, Grand Seiko, Oris, and so many more. All your favorites. You know you're buying the right watch from the right folks. From entry-level watches to the grail one you want someday, Topper Jewelers has it all. They even have a huge selection of pre-owned watches, all backed with their one-year warranty. And coming this summer, an incredible new location in Silicon Valley. So visit topperjewelers.com to learn more and get your first or your next watch at Topper. That's T-O-P-P-E-R jewelers.com. Topperjewelers.com. Yeah, I think too, something that um, I don't know if people have felt before, but like when you work, when you have a job, but it's also what you would want to do if you weren't getting paid to do it. Like for me, yeah, the first time that happened was when I was working in clothes, like and, and being around it where I was like, if no one was paying me, I would be just hanging out here, you know, saying I got to use the bathroom or whatever, just so I could stay longer. Like it was any, you know, and that feeling, you know, I have a few friends whom for them, you know, you, you work to live, uh, you know, and that's like, fine, like I, I'm going to go do this. And then that way I can go do what I really want, which is, I don't know, uh, right. working on a car or something like that. But it's like, when you're in that sweet spot, it's the best feeling on earth. Like there's just nothing like it. And, you know, especially at this time, the whole world, uh, of menswear and fashion. And, and that is like on this, you know, ascension to where, you know, people like want to make pilgrimages out to Sid Mashburn and Atlanta all of a sudden is a spot for clothes. Like I just, people totally forget how crazy that was. Like no one was like, wait, Atlanta for clothes. Right. I mean, cause Atlanta also had music, you know, I mean, it, and it, it just becomes, mm-hmm. and this is pre Marvel. <laughs> yeah. This is this pre, is pre Marvel studios, coming down. <laughs> Um, yeah, very- <laughs> this is right when I guess Walking Walking Dead and uh, Sid kind of came up the same year. <laughs> yeah, I think it had just started. <laughs> yeah, and so then you're you're at Sid for a total of how long? Twelve years. Damn. Yeah, I was extremely patient about. I mean, I've been I've wanted to do my thing since I was a kid, you know. But um, I was there. I wrote it out for a long time. Well. You know, and so what, what inspired the kind of the doubling down on factors and the creating of that? Like, cause it, it sounds like what you just said, it was kind of in the back of your head the whole time. I mean, again, it's something I wanted to do for so long, but I was also working with someone who had wanted to do it for a long time and was doing a really good job of it, you know, and it was so like-minded, but I think as you get older and you realize you have a point of view that you, you you got to go down swinging to share it. You know, you can't, you can't share it with someone else if you have it on your own, really. Um, I was, I think I just got to a point where I didn't want anything I was thinking or design wise or retail wise to be filtered by anyone unless it was like a best friend working with me or something, you know? Right. I wanted to, I wanted to use my own voice, my own point of view and see what I could do and also create one life, you know, and not split like, you know, share music and design in the same spot in the same mind space. Yeah. I mean, it. what was the first piece that made you be like, okay, I'm going all in? Was it, was it, was it something that you made that someone latched onto or did you just jump without even that, that safety net yet? So I think really I started from a store concept because that's what was most natural to me. I was like, I want a store. And then what do you want to do with the store? I want to have Brands from all over the world that I really like that I can't find anywhere. Brands that aren't in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And then simple things that aren't in the even the Southeast, like Ben Davis. You know, this is, you know, two or three years ago. I wanted that line because it was very important to me. Um, But I wanted to put things around it that you couldn't get, like I said, in the U.S. or especially in the Southeast that I think would be. And I wanted to create this environment of a store. And within that store, I created its own house line called Factors. And I thought I was going to have an opportunity to open this store in a spot that I was interested in Atlanta. And so I started like, you know, banging around ideas of what I would want a store to be like and what the branding would be like. And I kind of, it, it never panned out. So I just tabled it and I had all this, like I had incubated this concept and had it there as a deck, you know, mm-hmm. just sitting for 
when it was time. But I think once the pandemic hit, um, a store wasn't of interest to me anymore, you know. Um, but Factors was of interest. <laughs> and de- and designing a line became the priority. And so I extracted the Factors idea out of the store and tabled the store idea and just focused on that collection. You know, like, what can I do with this brand that can be direct to con- Direct to customer, custom driven, and ready to wear wholesale based. Yeah. So it can be global because I didn't, though I'm from Atlanta and extremely influenced by where I am and my everyday here, I didn't want to design something that would just make me a living right here. And it would look a $3,000 suit on the second floor of a building is probably not too feasible if I just think about. Atlanta is my customer, you know, I, I say it often, but I, I really went after key markets early on as a, in a mindset of we're going to be Atlanta, New York, LA, Berlin, Paris. And then we hopefully can add, you, Damn. Know, you know, Tokyo or London, things as we grow. But like, I want to go after those, I want those customers to be all over. I'm not trying to make a you know, Factors isn't trying to create like a $150 million business right now. I want 2,500 fans that spend like $2,500 a year. You know, that's less than one suit. But I think that's a core customer that is also could be like a core fan group or fit friend group that are like-minded and people you would want to sell to and hang out with. You know, you like blur the line. And I've seen it happen a lot recently, which makes me feel really good about the growth of what we're doing. because. Um, I did move everything from my house here as far as like all my music equipment and my clothes and everything that in, that I need to be around to create every day. And what I see now with those blurring lines is I'll have an appointment and we're fitting trousers or fitting jackets or whatever, just talking about clothes or planning or whatever. And then it ends up with, you know, like amps on <laughs> and somebody just playing the guitars or something that I have in here, which is, I mean, that's, that's kind of dreamy. For me, I never thought I would be able to do that every day. And so to create a space where I can make a living like that is amazing. Yeah. Well, we, because I remember when I first saw, <clears throat> like when I heard about Factors, I was like, what is this? Like the influences, it was very, you know, if, if this, say this was like a venture capital backed brand, right? And yeah. you had your deck, like you were talking about earlier. No one would have immediately signed on to it because there was no, oh, it's, we we fixed this problem or here's our here's our customer funnel here's here's why this is going to sell really well in silicon valley or why this will do really i mean everything that i saw in factors i was like whoa this is just energy this is it's somewhat it's, it's like 1970s it, it's got some 80s stuff into it and all the things aside i never thought would go together and then when i look at it i was like oh my god like like the cuts you know, like the, the, the mohair pants, the, the frog mouth uh, pockets on there. I'm serious. It is unbelievable. It's so All that so comes good. from a very specific point. Like, I don't follow trends, you know. I know everybody says that, but I really don't. Like, I follow what I love and nothing. Like, I don't care if a factor suit looks completely different next year as it does right now, you know. Um, if you ask me where each design detail comes from, I can walk you through it. I wanted... I wanted the jacket to be long because all the jackets I'd been around were short. <laughs> usually, <laughs> okay. <laughs> usually, everything I do comes from a place of if somebody else is doing it, I don't want to do it anymore. You know, mm-hmm. I, I want to be, I want to be different. I want my things to be a little weird at times, and I want people to be able to be like tacky. As I, <laughs> you know, I think it's it's fun to take chances like that. But I, um, the length came from a, a place of wanting to have a longer silhouette to kind of freshen up what I've been doing for so long. And then um, most genres of clothing that come with that length come with a broad, heavy shoulder, you know? Yes. That, I've never liked that. As a 16-year-old, I wanted a jacket that looked like a Norman Hilton jacket, you know, or a Southwick jacket. Right. Something that's super machine-driven on the shoulder, like very clean but soft, um, narrow on the frame. So, it, you know, it's it's got like a petite type, type shoulder on it. Again, from day one, my vision is to design just as much for women as it is for men as far as how my suits and shirts fit. So mm. a lot of what this comes from is 
thinking about how I want a suit to drape on a woman. So I want a petite shoulder with a longer skirt and no shape in the waist. You know, I don't want any curves to be shown unless it's while someone is walking or in fluid movement. Um, I, I, I think that what I do want to be really tailored is the shoulder and then the waist and seat yeah. and everything else just drapes from there. But the lapel width, the pocket flaps, the high vent, all of those things are complete logos to me. They're like attitude, dr- dramatic, mm. dramatic moments of attitude, you know, because the number one suit anybody can buy from me or anyone else, I think is just a, a Navy or in my case, like a midnight suit because yeah. it can be worn so many different ways. So if you're thinking about design, how can I get as much attitude attitude out of this basic piece as possible? Make it in leather <laughs> and make it with mohair and and take all of the details out that I don't want there, like darts, you know, anything dandyism, I tried to like remove tapered waist, waist suppression, darts in the jacket. And I wanted to um create to me it's a fresh silhouette. It's a narrow, soft shoulder with no Neapolitan sleeve head, and then it drapes straight down like an A line dress almost yeah. into a longer skirt length with, you know, um, wider pocket flaps and wider lapels and higher vents for attitude, essentially on something that's just a basic, like a navy suit. And then that feeds through the whole um, collection of jackets, whether it be single breasted or double breasted and all the fabrications. And then the pocket that you mentioned on the trouser comes yeah, the, from a place of it's a it's like a flared leg trouser, higher waist. It's a straight leg trouser more than flare. I think you see okay when people um so on the trouser we have designed it to where we're still mainly a, a direct to consumer brand, so we can get away with a lot of stuff mm-hmm. when it comes to this kind of thing. Like if I create a trouser that you can skate in, I can make you fit like a skate pant, if I size you up two sizes and take in the waist, you know, then you can use that as a skate pant. But you could also buy that same trouser in your true waist size and you could have this like tailored look to it where mm. then we could take in the thigh and make it like a sort of flare. You know, we're talking like 26 thigh to 20 inch bottom with a 21 knee. So there's not much flare, but it is wider than a normal trouser on the market. And, you know, but there's a flexibility there when you're direct to consumer that you can use larger fits as a blank canvas to then give a custom experience to each person, you know, as right. and that's how we would do off the rack out of the office. Now, when you're designing a suit custom, we can kind of play with um, however you want it to be. But a lot of people just want me to tell them what to how to fit it, you know, which is good. And I I like a straight pant more than like a flared pant personally, but I, I have made some more flared things for people. So, yeah. Um, it is something that is doable. But the pocket, I do want to t- tell you where that, that comes from a place of being able to put things, take things in and out of your pockets as you drive or as you're sitting and things not fall out of them ah. <laughs> as much. Because I think that's also one thing people really love about jeans is they're so wearable because they're functional. You know, they're, you want to wear them all the time because they just work and they're easy. That's you can true. put a ton of stuff in your pockets. I think a factor suit has 14 pockets in them and every one of them should be like usable. You know, we don't base our things on the rack. Everything's open. You can you can pout in the mirror and put your hands in your pockets and slouch and do all those things that factors people do, you know, <laughs> um, in this in the store as you're trying it on, because it's not fa- it's not it's not tender, or fancy or basted or. You know, it's it's meant to be broken, and I think people should see it like that. You can put your hands in the pockets, the pan or the jackets, or whatever. So, the access of those front pockets is why it went there. Yeah, and then rem- so usability, lining aligning with as much as minimal approach as we can. You know, there's no waistband on the. There's, it's like a Hollywood waistband. Mm-hmm. There's no dart in the jacket. There's no yoke on the shirts. I just wanted to find ways to like take stuff out. Yeah, because I would say it doesn't look like this. The designs and the the accents that you're referring to are like done for nothing in the sense that you know how like some people you would add a detail that's unnecessary to just try to set yourself apart, but it actually serves no functional purpose. Like all right. of your stuff looks like oh, this is a calculated decision. This is why you know. And it's funny to jump back one sec because you talked about you don't like trends. I will say this is fine. Factors is, in my opinion, the if someone said what is 2022 trend, I'd say everything that Factors has. I mean, <laughs> I will. I'm not going to combat that. And I think no, yeah, I mean, it's great. The right, yeah, I think we're right in with where we should be. Yeah. Um. 
naturally. <laughs> I think it's a, a natural move, you know? And like I say, nothing's sacred. So as far as design, or I'm not trying to keep the same lapel width or same jacket length for every collection or, you know, the same button stance even. So as soon as we want to move, we'll keep moving. The the thing that is counterintuitive to a lot of people about that is they feel like they spend $3,000 on something that was just of the moment, you know, or our own trend. Cause sure. Yeah, let's say 70s, is all, you can see it in movies and TV and everything. What We are in that spirit right now. Mm-hmm. Everything good. And it's nothing new. You love clothes. I, what goes around comes around. And I think what I realize now that I'm doing my own thing at the price point we're doing it at and at the quality we're doing it at, these things can be w- worn very hard, very quickly, in a spurt of energy for However long you want it, it may be six months, it may be a year, it may be two years. But what what I what doesn't bother me now about something being that drastic, like the lapel or the length or those pocket flaps, is if you get tired of it, you've already worn it two years, six months, whatever. Put it in the closet. It's so well made. You're going to it's leave it there for fifteen years, or give it to a, a your granddaughter or something, or your, <laughs> your your kids, and let the, let it take on a new life. I, I want to create things that have different lifespans and not mm. just that first run, you know? Um, and that's why some, you may not want to wear a four and a quarter inch lapel five years from now, but like 20 years from now, you might. And I think that orange tweed jacket can stay in the back of the closet and because it's so, it's such a piece that somebody, it's an aspirational item, you know? Somebody like really wanted it and spent a lot of money to obtain it. So wear it hard while you're in love with it initially and during that, initial infatuation and then put it away because you know it's well made and it's going to be waiting on you when it comes back around if you ever get in that that headspace again yeah but i i think people that uh, sure there's going to be people that buy factors that they want it because in their mind it's trendy and may, maybe they'll go to something else but when you think about people like you look at some photo of like an old dude that looks awesome in a suit it's it's never what he's wearing it's the person <laughs> that's wearing it and how they're wearing it so you could, I mean, look, you could wear a Dior suit from like 2000, you know, like an, an Eddie Slimane Dior suit and never not wear it. And people are still going to think you look good in it because if right. you wear it and you look like a badass, like, people will be like, well, you know, he's, that's his thing like that. You know, it's so, but cause some of the stuff when you talked about, oh, it's like a little seventies, like it's like seventies, it's nineties. It's, and then it's other stuff where I don't ever recall and correct me if I'm wrong, but like. The, the chain, the chain mesh shirt, like that is so out there and so genius. W- where did that come from? So there's a Fassbender movie that he was the lead in, um, in 69 called Ball. Yeah. And not Michael so, Fassbender. You're talking about Fassbender. No, I'm talk- yes. I'm talking about Fassbender. Yeah. <laughs> the German director, but he yeah. is so perfectly gross in this film. And he's the, again, it's not his movie. He's the lead in it. And it looks like he showed up on set in his own clothes. And the director was just like, that's, we got to roll with it. That's perfect. And the whole movie, so the whole movie he is wearing, um, what would, what we would call wheat jeans or Bedford cords or whatever, like ivory Mm -hmm. Bedford cords with a black leather jacket. And underneath that, as his underpinning, he has on a mesh shirt Mm. and it, I could not keep my eyes off it, off of it. And when I watch a movie, I'll usually, I can watch it on mute. I don't really get, care about the story. I just want to see the visual, you know? So mm-hmm. I watched this movie like over and over and over again. Um, and this shirt just kept like wrapping itself around me. I, I was obsessed with it. So I started researching it. And to this day, I've never found this shirt, but it is a German military shirt. And through my search of that German military shirt that Fassbender had put underneath his leather jacket, I came I came across this Belgian military shirt and an L.L. Bean version of it that was used for fishing underwear. Oh. And I kind of ordered both of those. And a friend of mine put me on to a tip that that Belgian shirt was actually at a military store here in town. So I rolled out there and bought every one they had because it became the perfect underpinning for a midnight mohair suit and the leather pants and corduroys or whatever. So my original vision was to take it and put it like in these three to five inches of top of your neck, mm-hmm. before, you know, just a dude wearing an Oxford shirt. Mm-hmm. You're having a conversation with him in five minutes later. You go, what the hell is that mesh <laughs> situation under there? You know? So that's where it came from. But again, 
everything I do is just a mu- as much about women as it is men within these was it within the shop and how we merchandise and everything. So women gra- grabbed onto it in a whole nother way. And that's when it really took on its own life. Like it, it became like confident dudes and then women wearing it like everyday wear. You cut the top, you cut the bottom off and wear it as a skirt. Yeah. Or wear it over your head. You, you, you get three of them and cut them three different lengths or you leave it long and wear it as a dress, you know, or as a swimsuit cover up. It's crazy to see how many people like treat it in different ways, you know, but it kind of became, um, like a staple in the office for um everything we do like to underpin everything we do you know and it is the perfect punk rock compliment to me um that shirt it makes everything you know a little tougher (laughs) yeah i I think Um, and it hugs you like you it's not inviting when you put it on but once you have it on you realize like damn i feel like i'm wearing a girdle you know this thing like (laughs) it, it tucks me in it's like it hugs me um and when the weather's right it's great to wear underneath the silk shirt or the you know, the blue Oxford or, you know, going out at night, just let, wear your shirt open and let that be the peep up front. But I, I love it under the suits. I love it under the leather blazer. It just works with everything. And bone, midnight, and black are like the foundation of everything we do. So that that ivory bone mesh kind of fits perfectly in there. And it definitely has come to influence other things that we design in-house now, too. Really? In what yes. way? Um, well, we've been able to find other mesh fabrics that we have already and continue to make into other pieces, you know, oh. mesh pants, <laughs> no, but we have number one being like this 100% linen Japanese mesh that we use that feels like you're wearing chain mail almost. It like really hugs you again, like the way that mesh military undershirt does. Oh, is, is that like Airtex? No, it's, this is all linen. Holy cow. Over the years, I've had the joy of trying tons of brands. Some good, some bad, you know, always trying to figure out what works for me. But a brand I've loved and continue to love is Proper Cloth. Founded in 2008, Proper Cloth has revolutionized the custom clothing experience. And it's been where I get my button downs and dress shirts from, and I haven't looked back. They just get better. From incredible Italian fabrics to that perfect collar, Proper Cloth has made a seamless process to either measure your favorite shirt, yourself, or just visit one of their showrooms in New York City. And if you're looking for something more casual, Proper Cloth will let you custom order a polo shirt with incredible fabrics from some of the best mills in Italy. Take my advice and get a long sleeve polo. Wear that under a Proper Cloth shirt jacket and you got a stew going, my friend. Fun tip, what shirts do you need in your wardrobe? Blue and white Oxfords, folks, and a Bengal stripe. Let's go. Those are the three. Get them now at propercloth.com. So go custom like your boy or ready to wear. Visit propercloth.com to learn more. That's propercloth.com. All linen mesh. We do it in bone and black. The black's kind of got a good yeah. overshirt, gothy vibe. Yeah. Which also has become like a underlying theme. To There's there's touches of things that I've noticed along the way from either like a Teddy Boy era or a Goth era or a Zoot Suit era that have kind of reverse engineered them themselves into influence, you know? Yeah, that, that's what I was going to say because there's not... It wasn't intentional. Yeah, there, this is not, you know, because I remember I was telling someone about the brand and he's like, oh yeah, there's stuff's like super 1970s. And I was like, no, it, there, sure, there might be like an element here, but there's also, there's a 90s element. There's, yeah, there's like a Teddy Boy element. There's like a... A, a mod sort of sixties element. Like there's, it is not. And I think it's just cause people see an extended collar, you know, over right. a suit and they think, Oh, that's seventies, which sure. But like that was also going on for a long ass time. Before yeah. I mean, that's when it was <laughs> bastardized the most, right? Yeah. I, there's a, I think there's an elegant way to do it. Um, and an interesting way to do it. A lot of times I'll put the collar over my jacket cause I would rather have silk on my neck than mohair, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, and mohair, that's not the norm stuff. I mean, when I think of mohair suits, I think of like Reagan. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or even fi- like mid fifties, but yeah. Yeah. From a menswear background, mohair is like an ultimate tuxedo fabric. So right. when I was thinking of the basic Navy suit, which you can't start a suiting business without, in my opinion, I just wanted to give it a little flair and I wanted to give it again, some attitude. So Instead of using 100% fresco, which is my favorite fabric of all time, I just 
you took that same quality and used the tuxedo version of it with, you know, 60% mohair. So right. it has that luster when the light hits it. It's got that shine. So your basic navy suit is still a basic navy suit, but it's like elegant enough to wear to a wedding with a black tie. And you can wear it, you know, with jeans to a show. And yeah. it's still, it still looks, you know, interesting, I guess is the best way to say it. But yeah, the mo- and mohair is just an amazing yarn because it's so dry, it's so crunchy, it's so durable. And when you're, you you want durability when you're spending three thousand dollars to wear a suit every day. I yeah. think there's two. I'm tangent speaking right now, but I think there's two perfect ways to buy a first factors piece, and one of them would be to buy something that you can wear every day, like that midnight mohair suit. And the second way would be to buy something that you want to, sh- you know, like stop a show with, you know. I, right. I don't. Lo- I don't love the middle ground for a number one piece. I think middle ground's made for like filling in wardrobes. Interesting. Yeah, I think you you can't really beat the midnight mohair suit or go in the opposite direction and just making something that's a lead singer. And right. I think for our brand, that's the perfect intro. All these things. You're. It's interesting because you're also tying them towards playing music. Every every analogy you're saying is is, is a band analogy. Again, I. That's all I've ever done. <laughs> no, it's great. <laughs> music yeah. and clothes. And uh, I know music and clothes have never really been separated. They've always like fed off each other. I agree. Um, but I, I don't love how a lot of people do it. And I think a lot of people that mess around with those two together, is it, I think you can see when it's organic and when it's not, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, that's the hardest part where, you know, I remember a friend of and I, we were, we were chatting and he was like, show me the difference between a look that looks forced and a look that looks effortless. And he's like, without like referring to the person's face. Right. I mean, but I'm like, you can't, that's the face is, you know, like someone's attitude, their eyes, the way they, they carry themselves. Like, yeah. <laughs> otherwise they're still just clothes. Like it's, you, you kind of have to assume like, and also like, how does this clothes fit into their lifestyle? I mean, nothing is more awkward than anyone wearing clothes that aren't comfortable in it. Right. Like, I mean, I remember when I was first checking out some stuff from Sid, this is eons ago and you were showing me something and I was like, yeah, I don't know. If, oh, it was the cotton, like tropical print belt, D ring belt. Mm, okay. The this tie is, belts. Yeah. So long ago. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. And I think I said like, oh, I don't know if I could pull it off. And you were like, you either wear it or you don't. And I was like, damn. <laughs> right when I hear that, I'm like, I know exactly how you wear it. <laughs> that, that, that little belt was the, the lead in that outfit. You know, the, yeah. the best way to wear that belt is with a pair of 501s and a blue Oxford shirt. To this day, I would agree that that's, I would still think that that's the same way you should wear that belt. I mean, I still I got that belt. It's a good one. I think that's probably like the African batik one or something, huh? Yeah, it was, it's orange. It's orange and green, and there's like green floral leaves and stuff. I mean, yeah, it's it's a sick belt. <laughs> yeah, those are cool. When you told Sid that you were piecing out full time to do this, how did that conversation go? It was good. We had a um, at that time I hadn't seen him for a minute because we'd been in the middle of a, you know the isolation. So um, it was like a three hour hang and the first two and a half hours we're probably talking about Mashburn and the current state of and the goals and future aspirations for what they're doing and then um I think there was this moment of what do you want to do here and that's when I just had to come with I've got to find I've got to carve my own path you know mm-hmm. I know exactly what I want to do and I'm I'm ready to to give it a try you know and uh he was totally supportive and has been you know I've gotten congratulatory text along the way but yeah it was a, a good fluid conversation um between it was just the two of us i just met him at the office and kind of walked through what i was going to do and he wished me luck yeah and you've already had some pretty diehard supporters like right out the gate i mean i think within it, it was almost a year ago um sam hine a gq wrote wrote about you guys i mean it was a is a legit piece. I mean, you guys were getting lots of press real quick. I that's a that was a great article and just a, a great moment for us to launch the brand. You know, that was March. Our goal was to launch it on March seventeenth of last year, mm-hmm. which turned out to March eighteenth, and then that article was April first, which was really like the launch of the brand. That's when we started our Instagram and social and all that. And I had I had like a kind of under the radar website that I was texting, texting around to my closest group of friends and things like that. But 
Um, by that time, we we launched version two of the website. We had made a film on 16 millimeter and had written all the music for it and got all of our friends to model and um, had done all this heavy lifting and work to create this project and re- release it. And Sam Hine kind of just put it in amber, so to say, and put, put it all together, you know, on that April 1st. So, film yeah, on 16 years. millimeter for a clothing brand. That's not, every, every that's season. not normal. Yeah. Yeah, that's how we. That's how I want to do it. Um, I have a, a friend that I play, and he plays with me in Night Queener a lot of times, which is a group of mine. And he is a he's a director, and that's that's kind of the format that we want to work with twice a year. So um, we started with one that we filmed here in Atlanta. I think we had seventeen people in the film. It ran seven minutes and we scored it ourselves. <laughs> <So cool. laughs> yeah. And then, you know, we did another one that was split between um, New York and Atlanta for the second collection. And we had 31 people. Jeez. And all, again, all friends and again, scored it again. And my son included in both of these, my daughter has been in like the first one, but you know, I just wanted the first two times I wanted it to be like people that, knew me and loved clothes as much as I do and loved what I was doing. So the crazy thing about how those two films worked out is there weren't, there were not any pins used in the filming of it, which is the only time I ever pinned something was on um, the bottom of a trouser that was can unfinished. You, can you explain that, that further though? Because I, I think. So the way those clothes fit to each model is just the way those clothes fit. You know, that's the way they drape. So versus like a, a there was big campaign and, would pin everyone. But versus like merchandising and where you're tucking and and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying it's kind of like serendipitous how this happened. You know, it's like you kept all friends and uh, everything kind of fit the way that, to get the attitude right. across without having to be pinned and letting people just be themselves along the way while they're being you know film doing so. And the second one, just as a tidbit that was kind of interesting, we used a Bolex on the New York half of it. So you, everything's like in these eight second shots, which just creates some good, good movement. Sam being in one of those clips. Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, it's, it's definitely the, the, the coolest brand. I mean, it, it, and I don't know if it's because everything you're doing is technically not what a bigger brand would do. Like, you know, People are going to be like, okay, we're launching our brand. What's our TikTok strategy? And you guys, yeah, man, we're making our collection. Let's yeah. shoot it on 16 millimeter. <laughs> also, we play with what we have, you know, and w- there's a good crew of friends around me that have good resources and that are very interested in what I'm doing. So everything kind of comes, comes like organically. We And I think what's cool about factors to me as well is I want our customers to watch us grow out loud. You know, I they 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 probably will see faults and see things like a long. You know, we're not we're not a big brand. Um, we're a year old, and we kind of we, we we probably look like we're a year old a lot of times. And I think that's you know it's like crooked teeth. Yeah, cool. I I mean I think that's good. I mean the, the the most diehard folks are want that. You know, like I, I would rather buy from a site where the images are a little bit different or aren't the same thing than like a robotic experience that has Apple pay and, you know, two day delivery. Like that, it's just, that's fine. But yeah. it's like my, I, for clothes, I want authentic versus, I don't know, doctored and computerized. I mean, we definitely want to be a contemporary brand and we definitely need Apple pay in the store and things like that, but it doesn't marketing and uh, merchandising budgets aren't, aren't like driving our assignment yeah. right now, you know? And I think that's, you know, we don't have a social team and I think all that stuff's kind of obvious and we've got a super, super freaking cool, small team. There's like six of us. But in total. That's more than I thought. Uh, six. One, one friend of mine that's like full time with me. And then I have another uh, four or five friends that work around me on like contract gigs and things like that. So as we grow, we can start bringing more people on, but it's, it's still a small team and we do everything in house. And you got you know, your son. And <laughs> we, yeah, I have my son to model everyone. He's not really in the in the biz, you know. He's not really into clothes. He's into music, but he hasn't made the he's not like I was when I was in high school. He's not like trying to get into the design of it or even the clothing business at all really but there was like a video of you guys playing together he, he did oh like playing music yeah like I, yeah. playing together and i don't know if it was factors related or just like 
Matt Lambert Inc. related, but it was, I mean, it was really beautiful, especially as someone who, you know, I never got to be in a position where I could play music with my dad, you know, and that, that means a yeah, lot. I, I'm, he's very into it. Um, he kind of got into it about the same time I did in my, uh, during high school. Um, yeah. What's cool about the way Owen's approaching music is I think he, Owen is bringing it from, he's not as much about, I want to start a band and get loud and I want to use, you know, all night fuzz and delay like <laughs> my background. Is. <laughs> but um, it's more about the production of things and projects oh. and putting himself around other artists and like working with them and playing guitar tracks on, you know, rap songs and things like, which is, I, I love that. I love that he's, he is influenced by me in a way, but he definitely has his own point of view that he, that he goes after, you know, with a, he doesn't like try to go the same. I mean, that's, I that sounds like the best. I mean, you don't want a, a robot. For yeah. A kid. He's, yeah. <laughs> No, he played and he he learned and continues to play like on a nylon string and acoustic and a steel Whoa. string acoustic, you know. And this is a guy who like loves the Wipers and My Bloody <laughs> Valentine and you know Nirvana, of course. But um, these are, but he's learning that pure, which is really cool yeah, to me. That's whereas I was like, I can't play a chord, but I need to go get a distortion pedal. I remember my dad like arguing with me over an acoustic. I was like, I don't want an acoustic. I'm going to buy this Squire Stratocaster. Hell yeah. Squires, dude. <laughs> and this big, and this big jam distortion box. So I can play aneurysm in my room all night. Yeah. I remember I had, I think it was called like a juice box. I think it was when line six way before like DL fours, right? This was like, super basic it were they were the cheapest crappiest you know it was worth more money in like aluminum and steel than it was like the actual effects and they you know and I, it was just so weird and i was trying to do weird stuff and then my dad like showed me emerson lake and palmer and all this stuff and i was like whatever dad like <laughs> i don't like yeah, solos. No, he's like this is he's like this is what you want no no he's like you should check out al stewart here's the year of the cat and i was like whatever and now i look back and i'm like idiot <laughs> um well we're starting to wrap a bit i want to kind of go through some other stuff that's like in the factors world what would you say are like either three movies or a movie or you know that that help you know you had already mentioned uh the the fassbender film you gotta go with ball yeah okay. you gotta go with ball but like things that other other films that have influenced factors world world on a wire would probably be the biggest world on a wire okay yeah another fa another fassbender movie but so it would be, uh, I think it was, it may have actually been. This is all like Criterion stuff um, here. <laughs> two, two part. Yeah, which I definitely mess with. Another one would be on the Mystery Train. Courses. Mystery Train. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, those two would probably be the biggest influence for factors um, that I can think of off the top. Uh, what about three albums that you think have influenced factors? Oh, uh, man. The number one, I'm just going to go with what's always put in this, this record. Sun Ra? Here. These are the most factors records because I always have them in the shop. Let's see. This Sun Ra okay. record kind of start almost every day with this. This is okay. Bad and Beautiful, which is a, uh, I think it was a 50s movie soundtrack title that he plays on that record. It was his second New York record after he moved. Um, the other one that I fucking adore is Numero reissued this Israeli Italian guitar swinger, Charlie Maguire. They, he, they did a whole box set. Or, did a two LP set on him like three years Whoa. ago. And he, this is perfect factors music for in the shop. Um, Charlie McGuire. Dang. Okay. Let's see. Um, right, easy listening as far as like in the store, but this, this Miami jazz guitarist named Del Staten. Del Staten. Yeah. Okay. Another fave. Um, and then that's like three off the top. Lately I've been on the big Love and Rockets kick. Love and Rockets. Here. Yeah. I'm just going with what's oh another go to in here. The first teenage fan club record. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. The this one's really good. Pre bandwagon. Danzig? Wait, this is you, these are all over the map. <laughs> as as factors should always be. Yeah. You know? It should always be. Um other core to me is like this whole Melbourne Australian scene I really dig on too because I don't want to again with factors and music the same I hate when everything's vintage like when everything's old of course I feed off of what's old especially as I have like all these analog things in here but like 
I still love new music and I still dig for new music. And so I think I love things like exec or total control. Um, all these new artists out of, uh, Australia. Okay. Yeah. You know what? I, I think that's really refreshing that you said that as an aside, because like there are some, especially with music and like people that are music snobs. Like, I mean, I would say that I'm a bit of a music snob, but like, I don't think that there is no, there's no, new good music or like there's, there's no good new music. Like that's, that's Definitely so, not. it's so it's fucked just, up to basically just assume that like one era has all the music, it's new as you know, like I, I would say I'm partial to the seventies, but you know, to say that the music that's coming out now is all bad and not good. I think it's just, people are lazy and it requires work to listen to things that you may not like yet, or you don't know, or you haven't, you know, had a memory on. Otherwise it's just nostalgia and nostalgia is not music. Right. And I, I, I think it's just important to stay contemporary as much as yeah. possible. Yeah. You know, um, especially in music listening to me, I always want to know what's going on out there. I don't always find stuff that I like, but I still try to dig for it or have good friends that turn me on to it. Yeah. I was going to say, I have a playlist of stuff from the serious XMU download 15. And I always just take, you know, the last, I don't know. I'll take like a selection of songs that I like and listen to on there. And there is some, there's a lot of real good new music right now. I mean, so much stuff that I'm like, yeah, yeah, like, um, anything you're into particular. So I really like that New Zealand band Yumi Zuma, which is like very kind of like eighties pop rock. Um, but I would say like a, an artist you should check out is they go by Jerry paper. Um, and I remember, meeting this dude eons ago and um oh yeah i'm looking at this lucas guy. at the time was like this la kid and um you know they got married they moved back to la or they moved back to la his their music is just fucking it's so good it's really really good and like folks from bad bad not good play on it but i I think they only have like two or three songs right now, but I would say that's been in terms of new stuff. There's another, there's another band called Stray Fossa that I like a lot. Um, and then some of the other stuff is like, this isn't new, but it's, it's cool to hear all the new kind of Saddle Creek era stuff that's stemming out, whether it's like Phoebe Bridgers and then everyone that's worked on her album, like the Ethan Gruska and Christian Lee Hudson. And I mean, that that's like, I don't know. It's like maybe our generation's Amy Mann or something. Like it's just right. good b- music. Um, yeah, I've, uh, um, I'm playing with a friend of mine who moved here from Omaha, and she is definitely tied into. The, she's turned me on to a lot of like uh, Saddle Creek stuff recently because that's kind of yeah. her scene, you know. Um, so I didn't realize how much there there was in that scene, right? It's a lot, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's good stuff, and then and it's a very loyal. It seems to be a very loyal. Yeah, scene. have you have you checked out this other band called Nation of Language? No, they're probably the most factors band ever right now. Yeah, oh, they're really? they're from Brooklyn. Um, it's kind of like this cool sort of synth pop. It's a three piece band. Um, but yeah, you should you should check them out. Oh, they cool. I think they were on at one point. They were either on like Colbert or Late Show or something, but. Um, yeah, it's, it's a sick band. Uh, I'll yeah, I, I like them out. a lot. I'm looking at it now. Um, anyway, uh, well, this was freaking great to chat with you and hear more about everything. I really, really appreciate you making the time to chat. I know you got a lot of stuff going on. So, all right. Thanks so much. It was good talking to you. Yeah, you too. All right. See ya. That's it for this week's episode. You've been listening to Blamo. We're edited by Amar Lal. Our theme music, as always, by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. If you like what you heard, you know the drill. Share the pod with a friend. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Do the deals. Give us five stars. Follow us on Instagram for all the hot content. And if you want to talk to us and give us your hot take, we'd love to hear from you. You can call us at 917-267-2495. Leave us a message. We'll put it in a future episode. Or just send us an email at info at blamopod.com. And if you want to hang with us and join the Blam fam, visit patreon.com forward slash Blamo, where we have tons of exclusive episodes, uh, separate shows. I mean, geez, we got the new uh, show with John Moy and Gene Delian. And then we got Blamo Presents Derek Guy and our amazing Slack community. All right, that's it from me. 
I'll see you all next week.